Uh, good morning to you all. I'm going to go ahead and start us with a word of prayer so that we can get right into it and maximize the time that we have allotted to us this morning. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we look to you this morning and we are thankful for again the opportunity and privilege to be able to assemble together, to do so with hearts and minds that desire to know what your word says and how that applies to every facet of our lives, every aspect of your church. And so again this morning, God, we pray that you would be with us in the things that we consider, that you would continue to grant us to grow in grace and knowledge, give us understanding and earnestness in our application of your word to our lives. We pray that we would do so in a way that honors you and that you would grant us uh, to continue uh, to strive by your grace and in your strength to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we are actually looking at the idea of deacons. One of the reasons why is because in the uh, kind mercies of God, uh, as this church has been uh, planted and established, God granted that we have, as is absolutely necessary, a plurality of elders and that's what, when Paul would go and when, when uh, uh, he would send Titus, they would appoint elders in all the churches. The one thing that's not mentioned in all of those things is them appointing deacons in all of the churches because the eldership is the role of leadership and that which was most essential. The role of deacons would come along later and serve very useful helpful and practical purposes but non-essential role in the establishment of a church for example on the day of pentecost we come to know from the scriptures about three thousand people came to faith that day shortly thereafter that number went from three thousand to five thousand and in a church of approximately 5,000, you have 12 pastor elder apostles kind of overlooking that congregation. It is not until chapter 6 that we first see the most likely appointment of deacons. And one of the challenges you'll find if ever you have the opportunity to study it, the timeline of the book of Acts because it does not give us a date or a year, it leaves men to their creativity. What happens when you leave men to their creativity? A bunch of nonsense. A, a bunch of imaginary ideas. And so the, the challenge becomes, and so I'll simply lay out uh, the likely range rather than give you precision because I should only speak with precision when the script, scripture speaks with precision and speak in generalities when the scripture speaks in generalities. We generally understand from the time the church began until the appointment of apostles was somewhere between about three to seven years. Well, then they weren't really a church if they didn't have deacons weren't they what does a church need to have an assembly of believers baptized and united in the name of Christ and having elders appointed remember what did the church commit themselves to the apostles doctrine the breaking of the bread fellowship and prayer and realistically often what will happen and what's blessedly happened here at Providence Church is in the context of the church when practical things need to be done, people step up. And so this is taken care of and that is taken care of. And, and so when so many things are taken care of, you think we have to put uh, deacons in place because things are falling through the gaps. Things are falling through the cracks. Things aren't being attended to as they need to be attended to. In the kindness of God, in, in the six or so years that we have been here, there haven't really been too many things that have fallen through the gaps 
And the blessed reason why is because God has stirred the hearts of his people to join together and to serve wherever there is need, whether or not they have that title, whether or not they get some sort of pendant that might say deacon, you know, or someone might think I'm not going to greet an unknown visitor unless I have a a badge that says usher or greeter or something like do people do that sadly in this world there tends to be well if if it's not absolutely my responsibility I'm not going to step up thankfully that has never been the attitude or the spirit of the saints here at Providence nonetheless as God has blessed and continued to grow the number who are present and in attendance Doug and I think it would be wise during 2024 to make sure that things don't fall through the gaps that we appoint elders. I mean, we appoint deacons in this church. Now, in order to do that, we want to understand what is a deacon, how they function, and what are their qualifications. And so that's what we will look at this morning. So I'm going to start actually on the page on the side that says, function of deacons so let's start on that side of your front and back set of notes one of the fun things about this study is when you go to the book of acts chapter 6 it is generally considered by most students of scripture and scholars to be the passage where we have the first deacons installed or appointed one of the interesting things about Acts chapter 6 is, do you know what word you will not find anywhere in that section? Deacons. Because deacons were those who were servants, those who were appointed to a task. And, and this, is, this is going to be the emphasis and we, it's, it's going to have to kind of break our way of thinking and our patterns of engagement that take place in modern Christianity or American Christianity or even European Christianity. The idea that deacon is a title. I mean, I think it's even dangerous and, and unnecessary to, to think of being an elder, pastor, overseer as a title. These are appointed services, tasks, and ministries. They do not become your name. You don't become Deacon Don. You know, the, the, you know this is not the design of it. And I want us to, to see how this unfolds now. First of all, let me read Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7 to sort of lay the groundwork for this. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, so the needs were increasing and the present leadership could not attend to all of their responsibilities without letting certain, certain things fall through the cracks. The, the number was increasing and a complaint came from the Hellenists, that is the, at that point, the Greek cultured and Greek speaking Jews they, that arose against the Hebrews, those more of the Jewish culture, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution, which sounds like a lot of work, daily distribution. And the 12 summoned the full number of disciples. So again, please note this. This is the 12. That is the leadership at this point in the church. It consists of how many? 12. Who are those 12? The apostles. The apostles were the first elders, overseers in the church at uh, Jerusalem. The 12 summoned the full number of disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up the preaching uh, preaching the word to serve tables. Therefore, pick out brothers from among you, seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, and we whom we will appoint to this duty. We, but we, will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. What they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of, of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, 
a proselyte of Antioch. They set these men before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So again, what I want to point out in here is in the midst of all of the tasks that God has given to those who are the pastors, elders, overseers, same, those three terms for the same role and office, their priority above all of the other practical things, the thing that has to absolutely be held front and center for them is the faithful ministry of the word and the earnest prayer for the saints, for the disciples. They are granted, and we're not gonna focus too much today on the elders, but it is their responsibility to give watch over the souls of the sheep that are entrusted to them by the Holy Spirit. It is a very serious duty and the most important thing relative to that and the the highest priority really in the context of the church is the ministry of the word and prayer. That has to always have priority and nothing else should ever impinge upon that. But there are practical things that still need to be done from time to time in church settings, of which I'm sure you're well aware. Yards need to be done. Uh, Vacuuming needs to be done. This and that and all kinds of little uh, things need to be done. When it's a, a handful of people, it's easy for, say, two elders to take care of it. As God increases those who are present, then the need would increase. Now, I want to note this as well. When we see these men, their work is very practical in nature. Now, we will see that because of a spiritual gift, uh, Stephen exercises a gift of teaching. And we see that in the scriptures. Philip exercises a gift of evangelism. Now, their exercising of those gifts in the service of Christ is not part of their deaconry. Now, deaconry may not be a real word, but I think you'll get it, right? Uh, It's not part of their functioning as a deacon in this context that here is a specific task that is falling through the cracks. We need to appoint some men to get this done so that this is not missed out on. And what is the issue that was falling through? Daily distribution for the widows. Now that said, these men would then be appointed for the daily distribution of funds to the widows. Do you know what they are not now doing? They are not now forming part of the leadership core of the church. They are not now... uh, in any way, actually, leaders in the church. They are servants serving a task. I cannot tell you how many times in conversation with people coming from various church backgrounds, they will say, my church did not have a plurality of elders, did not have multiple pastor elders functioning in unity side by side, Exercising, again, their distinctive gifts, so not doing the the exact same thing, not making sure each one has equal number of Sundays that they're doing this or that. No, each one using their gifts, but each one having equal authority and equal responsibility and mutually sharing the oversight and instruction and prayer for the saints. Okay? But how often it's said, no, our, our church, we had... One pastor, who's ever had that experience? Mm -hmm. And they will say this, and we had deacons. But in our church, our deacons functioned like elders. I've heard that many, many times. To which my question is, why? 
When someone says our deacons function like elders, they're trying to convince me that though they had one single pastor, they were still generally biblical because he was functioning with a council of men, the deacons, as if they were elders. But the qualifications for deacons and elders are not identical. And actually for those who are deacons to function as elders is unbiblical. So, uh, so what's shocking is their intention in sharing this with me in my previous church, our deacons functioned as elders. They're wanting to commend their previous experience to me and it's having the opposite effect. Uh, again, noting this, their name speaks of them as being servants. That's literally what the term deacon means, servant or minister minister not holding a position of leadership it is a practical work it's not even a spiritual work they were distributing what food and or monies to the widows and it is done in the service of the saints who are part and member of the body the term diaconus means one who executes the commands of another I mean, I'm giving you the lexical rendering. A deacon is one who executes the command of another, especially of a, of a master. So it is a servant, helper, or minister. Generally, a person who renders helpful service. Therefore, does a deacon make commands or execute commands? It, it's, it's quite clear. Now, your experience may be different. And sometimes, you know, and I hope it's not the case here, but I know sometimes our tendency is, well, I want to defend my previous experience or I don't want to defend my previous knowledge. But often that defending is based on our experience and our knowledge and not of the scriptures and even further, not of what is the word that was given by the Spirit and what does that word mean? Second thought here. So their work is practical in nature. Second thought. Their objective was to relieve the elders, originally the apostles, for the ministry of the word, prayer, the oversight of the church by taking up practical service to the body. Taking up things so that the elders are not in any way inhibited from doing all that is necessary for the ministry of the word and the prayer for the saints and the oversight. Third thought, they were accountable to the elders or pastors. The one who executes the commands of another who is going to be giving those instructions to the deacons. It is going to be the elders. They're going to be telling them, okay, your task is to distribute the daily monies, breads, food items, however they were choosing to do it, to the widows. Correct? Now, well, you know, I think I'd rather uh, wash the windows. I'd rather... It wasn't, it wasn't a matter of I'd rather. It was this is the task that is appointed you to do. Now, there may be other tasks, surely, but this is our initial entrance into understanding that role and service. Um, they were accountable to the elders. Um, it, it also says this, whom we may, or who, they, who we will put in charge. It, it actually says it uh, this way in the verse, end of verse three. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So who ultimately are the ones appointing? The deacons. The elders are the ones appointing. They are taking the communication and they are taking the recommendation. But if they have recommended someone, for example, as we'll see who's, let's say, is not full of the spirit and of wisdom, but simply... They like them. Or that's my uncle. Does that happen? Can nepotism creep, in, creep into the church? Well, that's my, that's my longtime childhood friend. Can that creep in? 
I, I, you know, I say it somewhat facetiously, it does. Now, please note this. Being someone's lifelong childhood friend or someone's uncle does not disqualify them. The fear of nepotism, the fear of partiality also shouldn't cancel it out. If someone is qualified biblically, eager and ready to serve faithfully, let them serve, right? But still, we will appoint them. So it wasn't, like, it wasn't simply the saints are going to select people. They're going to vote them into office. They're going to put them into position. The elders may be, I'm not sure about him. I'm not sure. But that the people have spoken. That's not the way that it is. Now, does that happen today? Yeah, the people have spoken. It, no, they wanted the saints to say, who do you recognize as faithful and trustworthy to carry out this task? Let us know. Remember, here's 12 men. And how many are in the church at that time? Thousands. Share with us men who you know, who meet these qualifications, who would be willing and faithful to carry out this task. Now, some might have been asked, and they might have said, Pfft, I'm not going to distribute daily needs to widows. That's below me. Well, shame on them, because what is below us? Any task that's for the good of our brothers and sisters, there's no such thing as below us. Because also, I want to back up for a second. Who was previous to Act 6 doing this? Not, not doing it well. Not doing it thoroughly or perfectly, but it was being done by who? The elders. The church leaders were doing it. Now, if that kind of humble service is not too low, and he's never saying it's too low. He's saying that we can't neglect our highest priority and responsibility to attend to these other things. The task has become now too much for us, not too low for us, right? So let's not, let's not miss that. Every, there's no such thing as small or insignificant service among the saints. You know, simple things, even the setting up of tables and chairs and those kind of practical things that, that may not strike anyone as significant. It is significant and it is helpful. As I can remember days where all those things trying to get all that done myself and just so thankful for when all of a sudden, you know, I run back there to do some, hey, somebody already fixed the tables and chairs up. Somebody already did this. I don't know who did it, but I'm very thankful. Now, people weren't lining up to say, it was me. It was me. No, just getting after it and appreciating that. Uh, their work was assigned and was not related to decision making for the church as a whole. They did not make decisions for the church. They distributed the daily distribution to the widows. That's what they did. Some deacons were also gifted in other areas and were at liberty to use those gifts. I'm not going to teach. I'm a deacon. I'm not. Well, that doesn't make sense either. We all, well, why am I teaching in certain times in the church, but I'm not, I'm not having the office of a deacon or the office of an elder? Why is that? Uh, because you have the gift, <laughs> and that gift is a benefit to the body? Why are we going to make it about an office or a title or a role? That's missing the point. How many... Or how may we describe the difference between elders and deacons? All right, using the terminology of the ancient culture in the times of the scriptures, elders are like stewards, that's the servant manager. Again, I say servant manager because there's still a master above that, isn't there? Who's the master above that? Jesus Christ in the church. The servant manager, the steward of the household is like the elder, and then the deacons are the servants. That the steward manager is saying, I need you to go and dig a ditch. I need you to go and bring some sticks for the fire. I need you to go and. And what do the, and, and what do the servants then do? All right, let me carry out my task. Because when each of us carry out our task, the household functions well. And when the steward 
helps the household to function well, then the master is pleased. So that's the picture that we kind of see here. For deacons, there's no authority, not leadership per se, but they may have a delegated charge directing of certain duties or works. Both are servants. Both exhibit steward, uh, servant leadership. Elders do so with regard to all direction and decisions. Deacons with delegated responsibility or leadership over specific areas, activities, or undertakings under the oversight of the elders. In other words, if a deacon is tasked with a specific project and then the elders come and say, look, we're going we, we're gonna to do it this way instead, the deacon doesn't say, this is my realm. This is my place. No, no, no. And be like, okay, so that's how you'd have it done? That's, those are the changes you want to make? I will make sure that those changes get done. You know, it's simple. It ends up being no place for ego, Right? And that's why there's also a plurality of elders, so there's no man on top who can develop ego. And each of the elders are holding themselves accountable. Let's pray about this and make sure this is what Christ would have us do and how we can best steward the flock that has been entrusted to us. So how then are the deacons chosen? In this text, the deacons, I mean the elders, chose the number, right? Who said, decided there would be seven? The elders, apostles, we could say it either way at this point. Uh, the elders chose. Now, that does not mean for a church to be a biblical church, they must have seven deacons. Is that right? No. This is based on their knowledge of the task of distribution. Seven would be able to get the job done well. So it's, it's not that. Yes, yeah, some accent came out. I don't know why. It happens at times. Sometimes I think I do the accent when I'm saying something that's false or nonsense so you don't think I'm actually saying it. You know, so I pick up on that, the reason why. Uh, accents often demonstrate a false notion <laughs> when I use them. Not in common in the world. Please do not misunderstand. If any of you have an accent, feel free to use it when you speak. Oh, boy. Can we reverse all this and delete? Okay. Uh, the elders explained the qualifications. Did they not? Men, full of the spirit and of wisdom. The elders requested that the saints propose the men, but the elders are still the ones who gave the final approval and appointment, whom we will appoint. So the appointment wasn't finished based on merely the selection of the saints. The saints served an integral role, but the final responsibility always falls on those that God has given that stewardship to. Uh, how elders and deacons are to work together. Deacons are designated for duties under the oversight of the elders. They may be drawn from, uh, 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 drawn upon at times for suggestions and inputs of wisdom and experience to aid elders' decisions. I would even say further than that. The elders may, with regard to certain decisions, draw upon the wisdom and experience of the disciples, of the saints, and say, those of you who have experience in this area or have done that, we'd love to hear from you as we pray and consider what God would have us do. So there's communication, there's transparency, there's not this sense by the elders, we know all things, we have all the answers, we have all wisdom, learn from us. No, 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 that's not the idea. Now, we have a responsibility with regard to the faithful teaching and preaching to make, make sure that we teach what is faithful and true. Regarding other practical activities in the church, sometimes it will be maybe outside the specific experience or skill set of those leaders. And it is wise to take advice and counsel from those who have it and then say, pray together. And based on that counsel from that individual, it does seem right. Let's go ahead and move ahead in this area, the responsibility. Um, the key thought for deacons is action, not decision-making. It is task, not title. Turn over with me for the remaining time this morning to the back of this page and we will look together in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
In 1 Timothy chapter three, the beginning of the chapter, it gives the qualifications for an elder. As we move into uh, verse eight and following, eight to 14, we have the qualifications of deacons. Let me read those and then we'll just quickly hit these highlights on the backside of our notes. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded and faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and a great confidence in faith that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so let's look at these qualifications. They need to, first of all, it says, be uh, dignified, men of dignity. That does not mean uh, something about their selection of apparel. Because during the winter, I've been looking much fancier than usual. Uh, but most of the time, there will be no coat, as you well know. You know? And, and so dignified, sometimes in our culture, we might think, oh, that person looks dignified. It's a, they've got a nice striped tie that's even bound to their, so it's not moving while they go. Uh, all kinds of notions can creep into our heads as well, right? Unquestionably, if there's a gray, grayish beard, you have dignity. No, 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 definitely not. The idea of dignity is not something that is based on the visual appearance, is it? What is it? They conduct themselves in an honorable manner. They're not crass. They're not worldly. They're not base. They're not perfect. They're not flawless. But generally speaking, it's clear they desire to live in a way that honors God. And their conversation and their conduct is consistent with that, right? They're not gadabouts and gossips. You know, they have good character. They're worthy of respect. Apparently better typer than I am as well. Worthy if respect. Boy. Um, they're not double-tongued. Now, this does not mean there's going to be an orifice examination. How many tongues you got in there? Open. Two. Why you got two tongues in there? No, no, no. What does double-tongued mean? We've all met people double-tongued. They say one thing to one person. They say another thing to another person. They may say one thing in public. They say another thing in private. It, it kind of goes in with the sense of hypocrisy. There's not a sincerity. You know, the, and the, again, these standards, what's often interesting is the standards for elders and the standards for deacon aren't for the saints to ever say, well, that's for them. These are standards we all ought to aspire to even if the task or office is not appointed unto us. We ought to aspire to these things, to be dignified, to not be double-tongued. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. You know, if we are going to make a commitment or a vow, we do it. And if we're not able to, for whatever reason, we just contact that person. I said I was going to do this. This has come up and I'm not able to do it. Instead of just kind of hope they don't notice. No, just be clear. Be honest. Be forthright. Not addicted or indulging in much wine or not given to much wine. Uh, that meaning is obvious, right? Uh, this, this is something that impairs the judgment and, and does not speak well of a person. This should not happen. Uh, fourthly, not greedy 
or pursuing dishonest gain. Uh, The way that it's again stated here in the text is not greedy for dishonest gain. The sense of it is this. Now remember, what were these people doing in Acts chapter 6? They were distributing the daily distribution to the widows. And if that distribution is coinage, then what could be the temptation to someone who is greedily inclined or covetous? You know what? I think that I saw bread is on sale today at this counter. The elders have given me this much money to distribute because this is the usual prices, but I know there is a discount today. So what I'll do is I'll tell each of these widows, go to this vendor where there is a discount. I will give them sufficient to buy from the discount warehouse. Not that there were discount warehouses then. Uh, And then when all the distribution is done, what should I do with the leftovers? Well, it was expected to be distributed anyways. So why not put it in my pocket? And then here comes the normal human justification. And then when I see someone in need at some point in time, I'll be able to help them because then I have abundance. So, so it's, it would be a pretty holy thing for me to do to just pocket it, right? No, it wouldn't be. But you, you understand how people, you know how people think, right? How we justify our misdoings and our missteps. So not greedy because they will at times be granted. Here's some money, please go and get this. Here's something, please go and get this. Now remember, we live in a little bit of a different day where someone can come back and say, okay, may I see the receipt? It's a little bit harder to hide than it would have been in those days. But nonetheless, this is something that needs to be. Fifthly, they must hold the mystery of the faith and hold to that mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, elders had to be apt to teach and recognize sound doctrine and be able to refute wrong doctrine. A person who is a deacon, they have to have a solid grasp of, it says, the mystery of the faith. Throughout the New Testament, the emphasis on the phrase, the mystery of the faith, is the mystery of Christ. It is the foundational, solid sense of what is the gospel. They've got to have a firm sense of that. Now, they're not going to necessarily be teachers and preachers per se. Some of them may exercise that gift. Some of them may have even more knowledge. But they should be those who know the gospel, believe the gospel, and have the basic ability to share the gospel, which ought to be every believer to be real with you and it says this in verse 6 they must first be tested and if they prove themselves blameless so it's not just grab someone and put them in grab someone and put them in you want people who have served who have shown themselves to have a servant heart and a servant spirit who have showed themselves to be diligent and responsible and then appoint them Though not new converts. 1 Timothy 5.22 says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, which is part of the appointment that was taking place there at the end of uh, that section in Acts 6. Now it says this also. Their wives. Now some translations there will say women. And somebody tries to run ahead and talk about deaconesses. Right. This particular word in the ESV, King James, uh, Christian Standard Bible, Geneva, uh, New English translation, it says their wives, and there is a reason why it says their wives, because this passage is referring to their wives. <laughs> now, why do I say that with confidence? Now, because carry on the flow of thought. As we're unloading deacon qualifications if supposedly in verse 11 now we've moved on to deaconess qualifications read with me verse 12 let the deacon be husband of one wife 
it's going to be a little bit harder for the deaconess. Actually, it should be impossible, but we live in a weird world right now. But the, so the, again, the flow is this. Now, someone might say this. Now, remember, what happens as the church goes by, there's distribution to the widows. And some widows may need more. Some widows may need less. Some widows over the process of time, maybe they get into some issue with their children who were helping to support them and the children withdraw that support and now that widow is in greater need. She lets the deacon know this, is, this breach has taken place. My need has increased to what it was before. Is there any way that the church might help out? If that deacon knows that, communicates that to the elders and greater distribution is now available to that widow based on need, imagine he now shares which is very possible in the flow of life. So and so, this dear lady, has had a conflict with her son and they are presently not speaking and so he's not helping her anymore and we've had to increase the distribution. Now, if the wife is not honorable, if she is not a malicious talker slander or gossip if she's not temperate and trustworthy in everything do you know what happens next you know what i heard she's in a fight with her son they're not talking could that ever happen in this world my goodness not could this happen this happens a million times over you know, and so that's why it is very important that those who would be appointed, they are going to be sharing. Husbands and wives share life together. There is a sense in which they are one flesh and there aren't to be many secrets between them, right? And so this is going to come up in the flow of things and she, the woman, will be privy to some private information. If she is a gossip if she has not dignity, if she is not trustworthy, could that be a problem? This is why it is important that the wives of deacons who may be privy to personal information are honorable, not slanderous, trustworthy in everything. Well, that would disqualify this guy and that would disqualify that. It, it's okay. Does that mean he can't serve the church in any way he can serve in many ways he just can't serve in certain ways where there might be a role or an office of a deacon where he might become privy to more personal and practical information that turns into the gossip chain he needs to be a husband of one wife that is a one woman man he needs to be a person who where God has him now he is a loyal and faithful husband not having a wandering eye not flirtatious in nature again the same kind of a thing here is somebody who is distributing to the widows not good for that fellow who's showing up to be flirtatious to not have character. You know, maybe there is wisdom in even then sending them two by two, <laughs> right? Which with seven, you're, want, you're trying to do the math on that. It's a little bit harder. Um, uh, unless for some of them, some of the widows may be living in the context of homes, of daughters or sons. And so there could be. So again, husband of one wife, they must manage their children and household well. Not that all is perfect, but well-guided and restrained. Why? Because if your household is not managed well, where should the, the saint be focusing their energy and attention? On their household. Last thing they need to do is have other tasks. You know, it's not to slam them and say, shame on you, you are unfit. It is no. Practically at this time, you need to give your energy and attention to your home. If your home is in order and it is managed well, then maybe you can also assist in attending to other things and managing those things well. So these are the simple qualifications and then it ends by saying this in verse 13. 
For those who serve well as deacons, they gain a good standing for themselves and a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. It is good as much as we don't want to be prone to pride. It is nice when Paul would write and speak of individuals in a church as being well spoken of by others. Right? We want to not we want to aspire to that character, not just for that conversation. Right? Not for the sake of our pride and our bolstering, but we want to be men and women of character and integrity. And so here is my urging to you. These are the scriptural standards and qualifications. Uh, Our time is pretty much run out. I just wanted to say one thing by way of qualification. Some will say, and we did look at this when we were in Romans. In Romans chapter 16, verse one, it says, Phoebe, a servant of the church. And people like to say, aha, the word there is deacon, so Phoebe was a deacon. It's like, well, that's the word for servant as well. And in this particular book of Romans, that exact word that is used of Phoebe is used one other place, and that is in Romans 15:8. And in Romans 15:8, it is a reference to Jesus Christ. Now, would any of us say that Jesus was a deacon in the church in terms of an office or role? No. But was he a servant? Did he come to serve rather than to be served? And so that's the idea of what Phoebe was. She was about serving. And there are multitudinous ways in which men and women can step forward and serve in the context of a local body. But there are also very practical things that sometimes the elders need to delegate and then have confidence that is taken care of. And that is done in the context of deacons. So here's my urging. Uh, Please be in prayer concerning this. And then Doug and I will be taking your recommendations as to who you think might be viable deacons to serve in this congregation. Now, in that said... If your recommendation is not ultimately appointed, it may be because we got seven recommendations and we have about two or three things that we're delegating that don't require seven people. And later, as God grows the body, the person you recommended may come on. It may be that some that have been recommended have already in the process of what's been going on been tested and shown themselves, and the person you've recommended might be delegated some tasks not under the role of deacon that they might be tested for in the future being appointed. Do you understand? So this is not about pride, and it's not about position. It's all about serving and unity and honoring Christ. Amen? Let me pray, and then we can have a little bit of time to get ready for the service. Lord, we do thank you for your word and we thank you that uh, you are the head of the church and for the structure you've laid forward in such a way that Christ receives all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. Lord, that he remains the master, the head, the chief shepherd of the church. Lord, we thank you that you have granted in this local assembly that Doug and I are here that can serve as under shepherds to Christ to oversee the flock and body that you've brought here. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've had your hand upon this body and are growing it. And our desire is in everything to obey your word and to honor you. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom as this year we intend to appoint men as deacons to take up certain delegated tasks so that we can continue to focus on the priorities appointed by Christ to us. And we just pray that you would continue to undertake for the unity, the care, the mutual love and service of one another in this body. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.